you know, I, I look upon my presentation as kind of a sweet revenge on the priest. Because normally you sermon to us. <laughs> and this is a time you are going to listen to a layman, you know, going to sermonize to you. So it may be taken as a kind of a sweet revenge. Uru Madhura Pradigaram. You see, even Mr. Mampurli, who is a good friend of mine, asked me to be present for this. I asked him on what topic shall I speak. And then somehow this topic emerged in the discussion that I had with Mr. Mampurli. And I had a very specific reason why I finally, or we finally hit upon this topic. Because Gandhi's encounter with Christianity teaches us, or should teach us many things. I believe his encounter with Christianity has really changed Christianity. Though not in a very pronounced manner, but in a very subtle manner, it really changed Christianity very fundamentally. And how did Gandhi impact Christianity? How did Gandhi anticipate, anticipated? You know the new trends and tendencies that you see in Christology today is something that I have been researching for the last few years. And that is the topic of a book which I am proposing to write. I think I will begin shortly. So, this is a topic which needs to be dealt with at great length, in detail, in depth. I am sure that the time doesn't permit me to do that. So I am going to kind of give you an overview of Gandhi's encounter, and then underline a few points which I consider to be important, and it is up to you to accept or reject what I consider to be important, because that is the Gandhian method. You see, Gandhi was born into a very devout Vaishnava family, very religious family. And he was influenced by his mother and his father. And you find two kinds of religiosity with these two people. Her mother's, his mother's devotion was very simple. Kind of a lay person's bhakti devotion. More ritualistic to the extent of being charged as very superficial. But she was a, an extremely devout person and practiced the rituals almost literally. And Gandhi says that, you know, his memory is that she was almost saintly. In his autobiography, he says that. But his father was a differently religious person. He invited scholars from different religions and listened to them explain the basic tenets of their religions, religious beliefs, and then dialogued with them. So he was a man of dialogue. Inter -religious, what we now call inter-religious dialogue, which I know is one of the topics which is very seriously discussed in contemporary theology. I can even list out the names of people, right from Candle down to Paul Nicker, John, I mean, sorry, John Nicker, Paul Knife, etc. What? This is it. So Gandhi was exposed to two kinds of religiosity. One is that of simple piety, and the other was that of serious theoretical discussion, or even you can call it theological discussions his intellectual exposure. 
So he imbibed both and tried to integrate the positive aspects of both. And the impression that he formed of religion, he summarizes in one sentence. He says that he understood when he listened to the discussions, because he was the nurse of his father, he used to sit and listen to the dialogue. And he, he understood two things. One was that morality is the basis of religion, religions, and truth is the essence of morality. These are the two things that he learned. So, if you just look at Gandhi's encounter with Christianity, you know, it was only Christians who did not come into the house of Gandhi to discuss religion. Because the Christian missionaries in that part of uh, the country were more interested in preaching from the wayside, converting people, asking them to change their style of dress and style of food and all that. And if you look at Gandhi's encounter with Christian, it begins from there. And then he goes to London and he meets a different kind of Christians in London when he was a student. Then he came back to India and then went to South Africa. And in South Africa, right from A.W. Baker, whose assistant he was, with other people were serious Christians. Serious Christians in the sense that people who wanted to practice what they understood to be Christian principles in their personal life and in their public life, including their executive life. Some of them were executives. So Gandhi interacted with them. If you look at Gandhi's own enumeration of his first encounter with Christianity, it is very fascinating. There is a lighter side to it. He said that he read the Bible because his Christian friends gave him copies and then compelled him to read and he read. He started from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. And he says that the Old Testament sent him to sleep. Now, just like many of you were sleeping, but many of the priests were very disobedient because the many had given them permission to sleep, but some of them did not sleep because, <laughs> because uh, you know, Dr. Koshi's classes were so engaging and engrossing that they could not sleep. And Trimeni showed you a model, but you did not <laughs> emulate the model. He also, he also proved that a seat makes no difference. <laughs> Whether he sits behind or sits in, on the dais doesn't make any difference. So Gandhi says that when he read the Old Testament, he fell asleep. You know, some of the books were so boring, you know, like the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all that. So it almost sent him to sleep. But New Testament was so different. It was absorbing, engaging. And he said that, you know, Sermon on the Mount moved him. You know, although it is very difficult to move a mountain, the Sermon on the Mount moved a person like that. That was Christianity for him. That was Bible for him. That was the substance of what Christianity stands for, the Sermon on the Mount. So then there was a serious kind of deeper study of Christianity. And Gandhi had discussions with serious Christians in South Africa back in India. He had continuous dialogue with Christian missionaries. He was invited in missionary conferences as a keynote speaker even. You know, in Gujarat Vidya Bid, where I am a professor now, has a room from where Gandhi taught the Bible, which is called the Gandhi Bible Room. You know, Kurula Sirimeni, when he visited uh, Ahmedabad, you know, I took him and showed him the room, which is kept there, Gandhi's Bible Room. He taught the Bible, took Bible classes from there. And you know, many eyebrows, many eyebrows were raised. You know, both Hindu from the side of Hindus and, and Christians. What authority has got Mohandas Karamjan Gandhi to teach the Bible when we Christians are there? And Hindu said, why is he teaching Bible from Gujarat Vidya Pid? He's a devout Hindu. Why should he do this? And Gandhi said, come on, come and listen. 
Now, just like Jesus asked the disciples of John, who I mean, some of the disciples of John were spying at this man, what is he doing? He said, come and see. What is it that you seek? Come and see. So, so said Gandhi, come and see. And so Gandhi had serious engagement. I don't think he was invited to the 1938 Thambaran Conference. I don't know. I have to check. Because you know that 1938 Thambaran Conference was a milestone in the history of ecumenical movement. That was where the concept of the idea of WCC emerged and it evolved into the WCC. So he was, he had participated in the missionary conference even in Sri Lanka as a keynote speaker. So he had serious engagement with Christianity, discussed with Christian missions. And you know, the, the people who wrote on Gandhi first were all Christians. The first biography was written by a Christian missionary called Joseph J. Dock in the year 1906 in South Africa. And the first book that was published immediately after Gandhi's assassination was written by none other than Stanley Jones. Stanley Jones met Gandhi, lived with him three times continually. And the first book that he finished and published after Gandhi's assassination was the book by Stanley Jones called Mahatma Gandhi and Interpreter, Gandhi and Interpretation. You look at the authors who have studied Gandhi seriously from the West and also from India. Most of them are Christians. And Reverend Holmes, who was the the vicar or the pastor of the Unity Church in New York gave 22 sermons from the pulpit on Gandhi. 22 sermons. It was he who introduced Gandhi in America. And he wrote a series called Gandhi Jesus Parallels in his journal. And when Gandhi was assassinated, he gave a final funeral sermon from the pulpit. And I was invited once to that church and I could see that the only uh, idol which really adored the altar was a bust of Mahatma Gandhi, right at the altar. So this is the, the point. So what I want to say is that in Gandhi's encounter with Christianity, Gandhi asked uh, the Christians some basic questions. What, what does it mean to be a Christian? What is it? What is the place of the cross in your life? What's the place of the cross? How to read the Bible? How to follow Christ? Not just the question of imitating Christ, Thomas Kempis, but how to follow Christ. What is it meant by following Christ? These fundamental questions Gandhi raised. And you know, if you look at the present scenario, religious scenario in the world, you can see that the most challenging religious fact of today is the encounter of religions. What do you call religious pluralism? You know, there are many religions in the world, and because the days of Political imperialism is over. You cannot impose your religion on people. But religion is a fact of life. And people are coming together. And religions are encountering one another. And we know that there are major religions in the world. Outside the Abrahamic religions, there is Hinduism, there is Buddhism, there is what may be called the Chinese religion. These religions are encountering. They have to encounter. And how, what, what is the way, what is the methodology, what is the positive methodology which can be used in the interface of religion, in the encounter of religions? It's a very important thing. We know that we live in an age of globalizing, fast globalizing world. I have serious reservations about the expression globalization. Because globalization as an idea, as a dream, as a vision, was conceived by our sages, our seers, the founders of religion, our prophets, our poets. 
where they, they thought of one world, the whole humanity becoming one family, Vasudhaiva Kudumbagam, where the whole world will become like a nest, Yatra Vishwam Bhavati Yaga Needam. But the present globalization is generically different. You know, it is the whole world becoming a market, not a family, not a kudum, but a market. In spite of that, we are not going to discuss that, those points. You know, we know that speed is the rule of the day. People are coming together. And there was a time when New York was considered to be the melting point of civilizations. Now almost every city in the world is becoming a melting place of civilizations. You know, civilizations are getting, melt, getting melted down. And religion is a very important factor in this. And therefore, the question of how religions will encounter one another is going to determine the future of humanity. I am sure that uh, some of you at least must have heard about the theory of Huntington, Thomas Huntington, the clash of civilizations in which he says that the future of humanity is going to be determined by the interface or clash of religiously defined civilizations. He said that uh, two major civilizations of the world, the Western civilization, is a Christian civilization. There was a time when it was called Christendom, a kind of imperialistic Christianity. The Western world is a Christian world, predominantly a Christian world. I mean, people may disagree with that. Gandhi disagreed. But, and the other, the Islamic civilization, which also has innumerable following. And so the future of humanity is going to be determined on the basis of a clash between the Western civilization, which is predominantly Christian, and the Islamic civilization. Clash of civilization, the theory of the clash of civilization. And of course, there was a response to this. The question was taken up by well-meaning people and... Uh, you know, they established a forum where uh, instead of a clash, they said we should dialogue. There's a dialogue among, among civilizations. There's a world forum of dialogue among civilizations. But basically it is going to be a dialogue between religions. So in this question of dialogue between civilizations, you know, Gandhi showed a model. You see, for him, I'm going to be very brief, for him, religion meant, basically, to put it simply, a life based on God. It's a God-centered way of living. You know, if God becomes the center of your living, of your life, your living, that is religion. And in this God-centered living, which is religion for Gandhi, Why should there be different ways? Why there are different religions? We all say that there is only one God. If there is only one God, why should there be different religions? We know that the, you know, people conceive of God, approach to God differently because there are individual differences or distinctiveness. I am different from the other person. And a, a, a set of people living in a particular area because of historical, geographical, cultural reasons will be thinking and conceiving things differently. So there are different religions. They are, the, 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 the reasons are basically historical, cultural, social. And therefore there will be different religions. But religion, each religion answers to a basic quest in the human self. The human self is a quest for the ultimate the transcendent. We know that we are more than our physical existence, our physical body. Is there a meaning to life? Is there a meaning to existence? Is there a purpose for life? So religions are answers to this question. And therefore, Gandhi said that every religion contains truth. But no religion contains absolute truth. The problem between religions arise when one religious 
makes absolutist claims. You know, there was a time when religions, particularly the, the Semitic religions, made absolutist claims. And that was the real problem that Gandhi had with Christianity. But you know, the situation changed since the Second Vatican and uh, since the, you know, the, 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 the WCC conferences, through dialogue, we said that, you know, there is truth in other religions. Other religions are through other religions also than Christianity. There can be salvation. The, if you look through the documents of Second Vatican, or the other documents, you will be the WCC documents, you can very clearly say this. It is accepted that salvation is possible through other religions as well. You know, people literally interpreted the words of John and some other words of Paul and said that, you know, salvation is possible only through Jesus, only through Christianity. And which Jesus and which Christianity? In Christian religion, you know, you know, there are umpteen approaches. So many approaches. That's why there are so many denominations. So the question is about these absolutist claims. Gandhi said that no religion can claim to have a perfect understanding of the ultimate because it is beyond human comprehension. God is beyond human comprehension. The ultimate is beyond human comprehension because our cognitive instruments have got their own limitations, inherent limitations. And therefore, you cannot conceive of God in its totality by using your limited cognitive apparatus. How can you conceive of something, conceive something infinite through finite instruments? So we must be humble, Gandhi said. So in, in, in Hindu tradition, we know that the truth is one, but wise people speak about it differently. Yagam sat, vipra, bhuta, vadandi. There are different ways of portraying it. In Jainism, there is anegandavad. There are different faces of truth and different approaches to truth. So Gandhi said that there is truth in every religion, but every religion has got limitations, and therefore we must accept limitations. And there should be creative interaction between religions, he said. So, in interreligious relations, encounter, Gandhi suggested a methodology. I'm just taking a jump and coming to that. He said that, because my religion is not perfect, I cannot claim that my religion is perfect. There are imperfections in my religion. Then how can I overcome the imperfections of my religion? Which become my own imperfections, indirectly, and sometimes directly. It is by studying or entering into dialogue with other religions. Because other religions are also attempts at understanding the ultimate and showing, paving a method. So Gandhi said that you must do a reverential study of the scriptures of other religions and absorb what is good in them. And then assimilate them into your own personal life and into your own religion. Normally this is not what is happening. Christians are interested in finding out the defects of other religions. Muslims are interested in finding out the defects of other religions. Gandhi said that the responsibility of identifying and correcting the mistakes in religions must be left to the followers of respective religions. So it is the duty of Christians to identify the mistakes in Christianity and correcting them. It is the duty of Hindus to identify and correct the mistakes in Hinduism. How can they do it? They can do it through dialogue with the followers of other religion and by studying the scriptures of other religions reverentially. Leave out the, the responsibility to criticize to themselves. If this happens, you know, there will not be clash. Clash arises when I say that that religion is bad, my religion is perfect. In the, uh, in, in the Upanishad, there is a very well-known statement. Each person should have a truth of himself, for himself. Ega, my truth. Mama Satyam. In Sanskrit you say Mama Satyam, my truth. 
I must live by my truth. I must have my understanding of truth. And then there are other people as well. And what about them? Then he says, Mama bi satyam. That is, my truth also. My truth also. Mam abhi. Mama bi satyam. And then finally, Mamega satyam yuddham. You see, if my truth only means war, it means war. So what should be the position? So there may be different perceptions of truth. So if you leave out absolutist claim and say that, you know, God did not reveal himself or itself exclusively in one religion. If you say that God revealed everything in one religion, it will be definitely a very absurd claim. How can you say that God reveals himself perfectly and completely in one religion? Do you want to limit your, your God to one religion? In the Quran, there is a statement that there are many religions because Allah designed so. Allah wishes so. Otherwise, there would not have been many religions. There would have been only one religion. If Allah wanted only Islam, then there would have been only Islam. There are many religions because that is the desire of Allah. That is the will of God. Allah means God. So in this spirit, Gandhi said that you study the scriptures of other religions reverentially, enter into dialogue with them, take the best, assimilate it into your personal life, and reform your religion. If there are limitations in your religion, reform them. I will also say how Gandhi did it and finish. I can give three examples, short examples. You know, Gandhi lived in ashram in Sabarmadi. I am sure that you are going to visit Sabarmadi ashram because I see that in the program there is a an Ahmedabad Darshan, and the first place people visit is the Abarmadi Ashram, which was the first ashram that Gandhi founded. Of course, one in Kochara, but it was closed down. And you know, in Sabarmadi Ashram, ashram life, the, the, in the Indian tradition, Hindu tradition, ashram is a, is a place where you withdraw from active social life or a kind of asceticism. There is no social kind of uh, I mean, social orientation in the ashrams. It's not a socially active place. It's a place where you withdraw, you contemplate for your inner realization, self-realization. But Gandhi's ashram was a place where he trained people to be social activists and political activists and constructive workers. Where did he get the idea? He got the idea from Christian ashrams or Christian monasteries. When he was in South Africa, he visited the Trappist monastery and there he found that the inmates were active. They were doing agriculture. They were socially active. And of course, they kept silence. They prayed and all that. So the whole nature of the ashram was transformed because he derived ideas from Christianity. You look at congregational prayer. In Hinduism, there is no congregational prayer. But in the ashram, Gandhi introduced the congregational prayer, which was something he borrowed from Christianity. This is one point. So, what you call, he, he Christianized the Hindu concept of ashram. And Gandhi was not shy about it. He was ready to accept it. Another example is nonviolence. You know, nonviolence in the Christian tradition is a kind of passive, passive thing. You know, I will not hurt anybody. I am a good man. I am a nonviolent man. So I will not hurt anybody. I will withdraw. I will be inactive in social life because if you become active in social life, you have to commit violence. A kind of withdrawal, escapism from active life. Gandhi found that this is not enough. No, Nonviolence has to be practiced. Gandhi said that nonviolence, to be worthy of nonviolence, should interfere in every human situation and must be capable of tackling any human problem. So, where did he get the idea from? He found that, you know, the idea of active love, he borrowed from Christianity, from Jesus, from Jesus, the life of Jesus, and transformed the, you know, thus he, one can say that he Christianized the Hindu concept of nonviolence, made it proactive in the process of making it proactive. You take fasting, that's my third example. Take fasting. Fasting is generally considered to be a personal virtue or a practice for attaining personal virtues. 
and for gandhi it is not like that you know it it was a, he introduced the concept of vicarious atonement and suffering love into fasting which he borrowed from jesus and christianity obviously and both christians and hindus were unhappy with this he said said that this man is kind of christianizing hinduism and adulterating hinduism argued the conservative hindu sanyasis including the shankaracharya and the christian said that you know what is this man doing he is unnecessarily mixing <laughs> christian concept into hinduism and you know adulterating so both these people alleged but gandhi was not worried and i mean one more point which comes to me incidentally is that you know how to read the scripture i think that's a, that's probably the most significant thing how to read scripture gandhi said that you know scriptures particularly hindu scriptures are very old you don't know how old is the rigveda maybe 3000 years 6000 years there are several theories on gandhi said that because scriptures are old everything written in the scripture is not acceptable to me he said that i will use two tests two touchstones one is reason reason the power of reason the power of reason is not this mechanical rationality that you find with the with these people but reason is a great gift of god to human beings so i will apply reason and anything that is contrary to reason unreasonable irrational i will not accept but there are certain things which reason cannot measure which is beyond reason there is a difference between what is unreasonable and what is trans reasonable beyond reason he said that there you use the yardstick of morality when the shankaracharya said that untouchability is accepted by the vedas prescribed by the vedas he said that i will reject those vedas either they are interpolations or they are fake he was not so then what is the way to read the bible what is the way to read the vedas the scriptures he said that you shall not interpret them literally but you should go by the spirit of it the word killeth the letter killeth the spirit sustains you know in the bible you read it so this way of reading the bible you know that in when we read the bible in my childhood i remember i can kind of make a kind of a confessional statement you know we thought that bible is literally correct everything said in the bible is divinely revealed and therefore literally correct you know this is what marcus bor calls uh natural literalism marcus borgas said natural literalism then you know from natural literalism you develop into what is called conscious literalism conscious literalism and fundamentalism are cousins from conscious literalism you move to fundamentalism you say that because this is divinely revealed you know this is literally true and therefore every word is literally true and no word can be corrected or changed so from natural literalism comes conscious literalism and from conscious literalism you know you take one step and it moves takes you to fundamentalism but gandhi said that text should not be read literally about the bible he said so there is a different way of reading how do you interpret for example the genesis story you know i i studied sunday school and i was also fated to be a teacher in a sunday school for some time my teacher in the sunday school happened to be the biology teacher in the school and in the sunday school he will teach the story of creation and in the school he will teach me the story of evolution and there of course is a kind of a cognitive dissonance and so for me it was a problem and i asked him you know how do you explain this i did not use the word cognitive dissonance because it's a later i learned this and he said that when you answer questions in sunday school you follow creationism 
<laughs> and when you answer questions of science in class in the school, you follow evolution. <laughs> you don't understand that, stupid boy? Sunday school is Sunday school and school is school. And if you distinguish them, you are either a fool. So this is the point. So how do you explain this? So there is a different way of reading the Bible, reading the scripture. You know, the Bible is not a book of history, although there is history in the Bible. The Bible is not a book of science, although there may be scientific truths. I know what the Christian monitor people, Christian science people are saying. The Bible is basically a religious book. And so there is a kind of a metaphorical style and you have to read it metaphorically. You know, the creation story is not a scientific narration of creation, but it is a metaphor on creation. And great truths could be told only as, only metaphorically. You cannot say it literally. You know, in the Bible, you know, there are places where say that the mountains, you know, kind of joined the joint, the mountains rejoiced. The mountains cannot clap. And even biblical, you know, natural literalists and conscious literalists will say that in such places it is allegorical. Only in such places. So Gandhi said that there is a different way of reading the text, scriptures. And that is a metaphorical reading, a poetic language, a metaphorical language, an allegorical language. And you must learn to read them like that and admit that it has to be read differently. Then only you will be able to understand the truth, take the truth out of it. So he said that, I am not going to accept whatever is said in the Vedas because they are old texts. Unless they satisfy the test of rationality and morality. In some places, rationality is not applicable. So morality comes in, untouchability, so on. So in Gandhi's life, Gandhi's encounter with Christianity, you see this. Gandhi absorbed the best from other religions, particularly from Christianity. And you know, this is my last point. Jesus for Gandhi was a model. Particularly his suffering love and his sacrifice on the cross. It was a great example for Gandhi. And you know the only image that he kept? Oh yes, oh yes, definitely, definitely. There might <laughs> have been questions towards Brahma Kumari. But uh, uh, I think with, with, with their session on silence, most of the questions should have been answered. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much. I'm sorry. I'm so I'm, I'm also going to conclude. So he, he, he transformed his religion. So Gandhi's Hinduism is typically Gandhi's Hinduism. He transformed. But Gandhi believed that it is the religion of religions, the religion that underlies all religions, but which transcends sectarian religions. So he, we, here is a model. In Gandhi's encounter with Christianity, you get a model, a model for a positive interaction between religions, which is a very important thing in the present context of human civilization, where you are invited to do a, a lot of critical introspection about your own assesses, personal assesses, the way you are practicing your religion. It is, not, it is not enough that you profess religion, but it is necessary that you practice what you learn from your religion. So, in Gandhi's encounter with Christianity, you get a model and you get an invitation to take a critical look at your own religiosity as an individual and to your, what, what may be called the transformative praxis. You know, religion is a transformative praxis. And so he says that you, mu you must change your life so that you change the life of the community, the life of society. You apply religion like that. So there is an invitation to transform it to praxis. And thirdly, Gandhi's encounter with Christianity offers an invitation to dialogue. To dialogue, respectful, reverential dialogue with other religions. I think all the three are important in the person context. And that is why Gandhi's encounter with Christianity becomes relevant for 
people who believe in religions and particularly for priests who are mediators in the process so thank you for your patience and thank you for not sleeping thank you sir